I was owning my weird, but it was one of those things where I really let it get to me more. And so now so much of my confidence has not just come from like, Ooh, I've gotten pretty successful at the things I've tried at. It is, I have talked to so many people who are now able to be open about their struggles. And so when you're able to kind of deal with those feelings and truly accept, like I am struggling because my brain is literally wired differently. And so holding myself to the same expectations is not only unfair, but it's going to set me up for cycles of disappointment and low self-esteem and self anger. And you only can start letting that go once you start to accept that, like, you have to find a way to do things your way, because a lot of times other people's ways are not going to be what helps you in the long term. Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Successful with ADHD. Today, I have Danny Donovan. Hi, Danny. Hi. <laughs> I'm sure you know who Danny is if you're on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Danny is a purpose driven creator, author, advocate for ADHDers, and she's cathartic in her comics. And she has a neurodiverse squad hashtag, which has helped build an online community. Hey, for adults living with ADHD. And she's been featured in publications like the New York Times, BBC News, NPR, and was the closing keynote speaker at the 2021 International ADHD Conference, where I actually met Danny, but I met her in 2019. <laughs> her unorthodox self-help book has been amazing. You probably have seen it. It's called Anti-Planner. So we know that with ADHD, a lot of people say, get a planner. Well, she has the anti-planner and it's how to get sh shit done <laughs> when you don't feel like it. And she does have a clean version for those of you who are offended and offers creative strategies, activities, and games to help procrastinators understand their emotions and overcome productivity roadblocks. And Danny's work has encouraged thousands of people to seek diagnosis and treatment. How cool is that? So explore her content at ADHDDD for Danny Donovan.com or follow her on social media at Danny Donovan. All right. Welcome. I'm excited to be here. It's been <laughs> a, such a long time coming. I know. I'm excited to have you. So for those of you who don't know, I met Danny in 2019 at the ADHD conference and she was doing her comics then and she was showcasing them. I'm like, these are so cool. I see the potential in her. Can you do one for my website? And she's like, yeah, let's do it. And we got into this creative mode and talked about it. And she's like, yeah, I'm overcommitting myself. <laughs> Typical ADHD. But I do have a very cool drawing from you and um, your autograph on it. So I feel excited about that. So anyway, Danny, when did you get diagnosed with ADHD? I was a freshman in college. I'm 32 and I was like, I think 18 and a half or 19 <laughs> um, when I got it. So, I, I mean, it was a long time ago, but it also wasn't that long ago, considering that like my mom asked my fifth grade teacher if she thought I could have ADHD. And my teacher said, she can't have ADHD. She's too smart. I mm. literally said that to my mom. And so it's like, oh, okay. I wonder, you know, what? life would have looked like if I would have known about it that much sooner. So. Wow. And we talk about that so much on this podcast about how, unfortunately, especially back then, teachers were just undereducated about ADHD, especially mm -hmm. in women. So, wow. Okay. So what happened then when you were a freshman that finally convinced you to get that diagnosis? What's really funny is I did not go in there looking for an ADHD diagnosis. Uh, I had started college and moved to a different small town. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I went to school in Kearney, Nebraska. You know, they had a really great graphic design program, but I really missed my friend. I finally found a friend group where I felt like I belonged and moving to a different area with a much different, like, culture, I was a culture than I was used to. Um, but like, I grew up in the city and a lot of people like didn't, and I was having a hard time kind of like fitting in. 
tried mm-hmm. joining a sorority, but like at the end of the day, I was not taking care of myself I was getting really depressed I was going home every single weekend because I really felt like I didn't I was trying really hard but I didn't belong anywhere and I just hadn't found you know found my people yet and I was getting really sad about it and I recognized those kinds of feelings and thoughts because I had been depressed one other time when we moved to Phoenix and I had to restart finding friends over again there's some themes here but starting over is really hard for me and so I went to talk to someone about depression and I was like, ah, last time I let this get really bad. I wanted to talk to someone before it was at that point. And she heard how fast I was like flitting from topic to topic. And I kept apologizing for talking too much. And she was like, why are you apologizing? And I said, oh, because it's annoying when I talk that much. And she goes, who said that? And I'm like, everyone and started like crying instantly. And she goes, does anyone talk to you about ADHD? And I was like, no, 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 no. Because again, I was 18 or 19 and my brain starts going, everyone I knew who ha- who had ADHD was like a annoying boy in my class who didn't have any friends. Like yeah. that was the image. I hate to say it. You know, obviously I've learned a lot since then, but uh, that was at 18 or 19, like the true stigma that was residing in my brain. And I like to think I'm a pretty open-minded person, but like that was still there. Then I was like, no, 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 that's not me. And she was a psychiatric nurse practitioner, confided in me that she had ADHD. And so Mm. I was like, oh, wait, I can be a cool, successful person also. She handed me like a list of all the symptoms. I read it and I was like, oh, no, (laughs) you know, uh, but I tried meds and it really was like that putting on glasses moment where I was like, is this, it could have been like this the whole time. (laughs) Is this real life? (laughs) But it's like for other people and you you feel it's like glasses that work like part of the time. (laughs) But at the end of the day, there's that also like sad and angry feeling when you get diagnosed later in life where you go why didn't anyone tell me notice or why didn't anyone tell me or, or I didn't even realize that it could be different than this. And how many years of my life did I struggle? And I didn't have to, again, 18 is, is older, but it's not like, I know people, people message me. I get emails from people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who are getting diagnosed with ADHD and are like, I wish I would have known this like 50 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. So you had said that you have helped like thousands of people identify that they have ADHD and get that diagnosis. What does that feel like for you, especially someone who, you know, when you first got diagnosed was thinking, oh, if I had only known this. So it's really rewarding. It's probably the best part of what I've done. Uh, and I do a lot of stuff, but hearing People tell me what a difference my content has made either, um, you know, getting them a diagnosis or giving them tools to explain their feelings and their internal world to the people around them, Mm -hmm. whether it be friends or loved ones, significant others, parents, and sometimes having that outside person be able to like show it to you and they go, oh, it's not just you making excuses. This is like a thing, you know, I, I feel bad. And so I, I get emails from, you know, people of all ages who are really excited to start a new chapter of their lives and feeling like hope for the first time in a while. Uh, yeah. And then I get a lot of people who are, I get people who are, you know, parents who go, I feel so much guilt for the amount of anger and impatience and lack of compassion that I had for my child. And I didn't understand how bad it really was to try to navigate this until I was able to visually, you know, see someone's experiences mapped out like that. And, you know, I know better now, but like, I feel like such a bad mom and I'm like, your kid is 14, you know, and like you being able to acknowledge that you don't want to, you know, treat them like that anymore. The rest of their life is going to be so much better because there's so many people who never get to that point, who never stop blaming their kids for their symptoms. It's all very rewarding to hear from kind of these different segments of people. Wow. So that's huge. I mean, the fact that you've impacted thousands of people so far and families, that must be an amazing feeling. But also like when you got that ADHD diagnosis and you were in graphic design at the time, like what happened to you? Fast forward a little bit from there. Once Mm -hmm. you started to understand your ADHD brain, you said it was like putting 
you know, glasses on for the first time and, you know, or sometimes or not all the time. What did life start to look like for you? So like in high school, I really didn't struggle that much academically because I had the structure of my parents and the structure of the routine and like people would know if I wasn't doing stuff. And that was what was so hard my freshman year too, was like that structure completely disappeared. And so learning to function without my parents around and still get my laundry done and still feed myself that's stuff that's not just grilled cheese every single night. And so learning to find some semblance of a routine for like self-care and I, mm -hmm. you know, picked up, uh, you know, gym stuff and running and reading while I was doing it. And so really being able to find time to take care of my meat suit. <laughs> but then the other thing that was really big was being able to show up on time in the mornings because I would fall asleep in my 8 a.m. classes because mm -hmm. I would be staying up so late working on the projects for my 8 a.m. classes and then I'd get three hours of sleep, you know, and so I was able to actually sit and focus on a project and not make something that needs to take four hours, take 12 hours because I keep getting distracted halfway through. Totally. And so that was really a big, a big impact. And so I actually graduated uh, top of my class in my program. So it was, it was pretty cool. So you graduated top of your class, but how did you do that? So you said that the medication really helped you, but what other types of structures did you put into place? The big thing for me was also I helped, I kind of accidentally community build really easily. I was really the easy person to talk to in our class. I really, I came in with a lot more experience than other people in my class. My junior year of high school, my parents got me a MacBook Pro and it was my, it was two birthdays, two Christmases and my graduation present. And I, they're wow. like, we'll get it to you early. Cause like, we're not just going to get you a laptop, but you know, cause I had been um, nominated to be design editor of our school yearbook. And so I got to learn how to use Adobe Design and Photoshop and, and all that stuff uh, in high school. And so when I got to college, I already knew how to use a lot of these programs. I had experience designing t-shirts and most of my classmates did it. Some of them have ne had never used any of the programs before. Some of them have never even heard of the programs before. Being able to be that person who wasn't the teacher that people could come and like ask questions and ask for help from. And for me, it really was like, I want all my classmates to get better because I want people to like, I would say compete with, but I want people who are going to inspire me, you know, and challenge me. And so everybody started to get better and we started to hang out in groups and all work together. We were like body doubling. If one of us had to stay late and there was someone else staying late, like we were less likely to go home. And so there was a lot of late nights, but that camaraderie and being able to have some peer support really made a huge difference. And so we graduated with 10 people and it was like the largest graduating class they'd had for like 20 years. And oh they attribute a lot of that to our class being really collaborative and friendly instead of past classes that had been really like competitive. Like, I don't want you to get an offer for the job that I want. So I'm going to hoard this information for myself. But I think a lot of us were very, neuro it seemed like a very uh, neurodiverse, neurodiverse group. <laughs> so that's probably <laughs> part of it. Wow. I think that is so powerful because you don't have a scarcity mindset clearly when it comes to getting the job and working with the community, other people. Mm -hmm. And because of that, like, look at where you are today. And we can talk more about that journey. And, you know, you figured out through your natural strengths and values, how to succeed with ADHD, not being taught it, but just because you leaned into, oh, mm -hmm. I love community. I love working with other people. Let me just do the thing and figure out how to, how to get this done because you're a team player. And that was really when I had said earlier that I hadn't found my crowd, I hadn't found where I belonged. It wasn't until I started to get them to know the people in my classes, because at the beginning you, you start with 125 kids in the program. And again, we ended with 10. And so around sophomore year, which is when like half of the class drops out, it's a really hard program. But by the time they have that many people, you start to finally have the same people in all of your classes. And yes. so that's the thing that's also really difficult as an adult, especially as you like change jobs or move cities. Like I just moved to Atlanta like a year ago 
And I happen to know someone down here who has introduced me to some of you know her friends, but starting over that experience as an adult, if, especially if you work for yourself or work from home and you're not in the same spaces as other people on a regular basis, it can be so challenging to not just make those relationships, but maintain them because us ADHDers are not always so good at the communication. And What do you mean? Out of sight, out of mind? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. And I talk about how ADHD is like a three-legged stool. One is finding your community. Another one is the behavioral approaches and sometimes medi- medication. So for you, you had the medication, you found your community and through the community, you were able to maintain momentum with that accountability. So Mm -hmm. that's awesome. And now you're providing that for other people too. And it's what's worked for my career now, which has been really great because there's absolutely, I love being able to be open about my struggles on the internet and then have a bunch of people tell me that they struggle with that too. There's nothing that motivates me more to go and take care of that thing so I can come back and post an update and be like, oh my God, you guys, I actually did it. And then people say, you've inspired me to go take care of it now, you know, and then they post their picture of their thing being done. And it's just a really fun feeling. I love this community. There's a lot of toxic online communities out there and the ADHD and neurodivergent like communities online for the most part are so positive and supportive and loyal and um, because so many of us have been picked on or it felt like an outsider for so long and we're like we found our crew we gotta stick together let's go right yeah. and I think that because you're sending such an authentic message and you're being vulnerable about your struggles that people can really relate to what you're going mm-hmm. through so like you're you're just you know like it's not even a job for you at this point it sounds like it's more of a passion it's just public art therapy and public processing. Yeah. Because there are people who you, you don't think about something until you see something and you go, oh, is that not, is that not what happens for other people? You know? Yeah. Or, oh, is that something that could help explain, um, you know, this? Because I still remember seeing Jessica McCabe's, she, it was just like an offhand comment as an example in one of her videos about laundry being challenging for people with ADHD because it involves so much set switching and waiting and having to mm-hmm. you know, get to it before the mildew sets in and you have to wash it again or the dryer is now all wrinkly and you have to dry it again and now you're shrinking all your clothes and uh, ask me how I know. Uh, but, <laughs> but not realizing that this thing, and I put it off until I didn't have any clean clothes anymore and then now I have to do seven loads of laundry. And I just loathed laundry and I had so much shame about how much I struggled with it compared to other people. And she mentioned that it's challenging for people with ADHD and why. And I started like weeping, just like weeping. And I, then I watched a bunch of her videos and I remember crying during so many of them because I go, wow, maybe I can hate myself a little less. (laughs) You know, like that really was the feeling of yeah. everything isn't a personal flaw of mine that, you know, I've been teased about or I'm self-conscious about. There are answers and there are other people who also struggle with them. I just haven't talked to anyone about it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I know that you and Jessica are like besties now. Um, so for those of you who want to know who we're talking about, you probably have seen her on YouTube before, How to ADHD. And when I met Danny, I met Jessica as well. They were uh, both putting on, uh, I don't even remember what you would call it, but it was like inter-class presentations at the International ADHD Conference. So I'm curious, like you accidentally fell into this, right? So you were just doodling and then all of a sudden you blew up. I made a a... So there's a, actually a little bit of story here. I had just started a new job at Gallup, had just started there. I was about two months in and they have these like couches that people can kind of work on their laptops out. And I was working with some of my female teammates and they want, somebody started talking about therapy and this girl's like now one of my best friends. She started talking openly about therapy and I was like, wow, I have not talked to anyone even my closest friends about therapy. And you're just telling me about what you're working on in therapy. Wow. You know, you're so brave. (laughs) I was like, Whoa, like it hadn't even crossed my mind that that's a thing that you would do. 
And I opened up to people and told them I had ADHD and they go, yeah, I mean, we kind of figured. <laughs> I was like, what's that supposed to mean? So then kind of got an uh, inside joke about how I tell stories and how the conductor of my train of thought, Donnie Danovan, is really bad at his job and keeps like wanting to take all these detours to take you to like the fan, like show you every single I love this pretty like cool thing along the way because it you know he wants to spend as much time with you as possible and doesn't want to leave anything out and so I made that little comic as a way to track like Donnie's journey because I really fell into that pattern all the time so I made it sent it to my friend and she goes wow that's so you and I go I know I made it and she goes you have to post this online and our boss followed me on Instagram and I had not told him I had ADHD and I was like, I don't know, or maybe I should like change the title, you know, and not put ADHD on there. She goes, well, you can post it on Twitter. Like you have like 600 followers. So it's not like that, that many people would see it. Goes, okay. And I posted it on Twitter and it, and it blew up immediately. And one of the reasons is like Aaron Brooke, um, who had talked, talks a lot about ADHD also had retweeted it to like her ADHD audience. And there weren't a lot of comics that were talking about ADHD. Jessica had her awesome channel. There were books, there were podcasts, but there were not a, like specific ADHD comics being made. And so I saw the response from the community. I read the comments. People, yeah, some people were like, oh, this is funny. And some people were like, wow, this is a punch in the gut. Why am I crying? That really inspired me to then start making more because I go, okay, well, this was fun for me to make and it seems like people like them so I'll try a couple more of these and the response was really great on all of them and so I just kind of kept with it but having those I would say ADHD thoughts of okay cool I like this now but how long until this deck of cards falls down how long until mm -hmm. I've, given it up? I've given everything in my life up like you never do anything consistently like the negative self-talk was so real as a creative I have finally found that once I hit a hundred of something, I'm pretty much done. Like I made just over a hundred comics. I made just over a hundred TikToks doing things like that, where I don't have to feel like I have to pick one thing and just do that one thing forever. Cause that's not how my brain works. Mm -hmm. I want to do that one thing until I get really good at that thing. And I have a collection and then I can find something else to like apply what I have to say to a different medium. Gotcha. So basically you're never bored. So yes. once you get to that point where it's, you lose a little bit of interest and you've already mm -hmm. challenged yourself and it's mm -hmm. become routine. New lane. <laughs> the Donnie conductor is steering you that way. <laughs> so now fast forward, you started with a blow up Twitter because Aaron Brooks retweeted one of your first ones. And now you've moved on to like essentially putting all of your ideas together into this anti-planner. So I want to talk about that because it's so different than what you see out there. It's not your typical book. It's spiral copy and it's colorful. There's tabs on it. So talk to us a little bit about that. What is in it and what type of people this resonates with? I was like hoping I know I had one at my desk at one point and I, oh, come on. Right. Are you kidding me? Maybe it. you I need a planner to, <laughs> for your uh, so it, yeah, it was really important for me. So it's so pretty the, the gold foil because it was really important for me to have like that tactile experience and being able to be something that catches my eye. Cause I like to keep it on my desk. Even if it's not open, it's sort of, someone had said it, it's a productivity spell book. <laughs> which I really like. Um, but like, what is this witchcraft? Right, just go uh, in there. Yeah. Yes. And so what it really, it really is a lot of like recipes essentially of like, or like experiments, right? If you have like, here's what you need, here's what kinds of things it's for, and here's how you do it. And here are some tips. And so much of the book is in that format, but it's broken up by emotions that are kind of getting in the way of you getting this, the stuff done that you want to get done. And so mm -hmm. whether you're feeling stuck or overwhelmed, unmotivated, disorganized, and discouraged. And then each of those sections are further broken down into overwhelmed, being like intimidated, overcommitted, panicking, or like burnt out. And so how you're really feeling, and, and it's got little bullets so you can read what those kind of look like. And if you're reading it and you go, oh my God, it's me. Then you can go to that section and it's got little activities, exercises, games, 
strategies for you to try and see if that can help versus you having a giant book of like 165 unorganized ideas. Like that's mm-hmm. so much stuff to go to versus being like, here are 10 strategies that can help. And then at the bottom of the, some of the pages, it's like, this pairs well with this exercise on this page, or like, you might also like this thing on here. And so being able to make the again, I made this for me initially, because I've been doing a lot of these things in the book for years and years. And so I started making something for myself so that I wouldn't forget all of the strategies that I've been picking up. And yes. then as I started to build it, I go, People would probably like this. <laughs> I've seen in my experience that things that help me help other people and really blow up. So sounds like you have a vision there. <laughs> and then as I talk to more people with ADHD, and I'm like, nothing about me is original. <laughs> your drawings are original. Your ideas are original. But yes, you're right. Isn't it crazy that other people feel like, the same way? Hyper specific examples of things that you think, you know, are just you think like the, oh, I leave, I have a bad habit of leaving half drank coffee cups on my desk until they grow mold like a science experiment, you know. I saw that page. That's awesome. Speaking of which. <laughs> so actually one of the things that I've got upcoming, which I have not, I have not really announced anywhere yet. So it's, it's secret. Be first to hear. On Successful with ADHD. I'm doing a podcast and YouTube channel. And so it's going to be about, you know, how to get stuff done. You don't feel like it still, but it's each of the episodes will focus on a specific task that sucks. And so it might be doing dishes, doing laundry, filing your taxes. I love and it. Each of those episodes is going to break down. Here's the most common obstacles and why you're probably avoiding it. And then here are some solutions that directly can help with those specific obstacles. And then I get to take all that stuff and put it in a, in a follow-up to the anti-planner. So I'm really excited, Yay. but I, it turns out that instead of just talking about ADHD now, being able to figure out the byproduct of ADHD, right? That executive dysfunction, learning how to understand it from the inside out and be able to like point at all of the things and be like, I want to understand why I keep doing this thing I don't want to do or why I keep not doing this thing that I want to do. Like, it's not logical. Make it make sense. And then if you can see it for what it is and go, oh, the reason I don't like doing dishes is I hate the feeling of that stuff on my hands. I have never worn gloves, like those big kitchen gloves while I'm doing dishes. I've never done it. My parents didn't do it. I haven't tried it. And then you do it and you go, oh, this fixed it. Yeah. That one little thing. It's like, oops, unlocked. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Or like the it, washing your face, right? Um, somebody on Twitter had mentioned putting on scrunchies with those like tennis uh, wristbands mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that when you're washing your face, that like stream of water doesn't Ooh, run down your elbow. That's and, such a great idea. But yeah, and I guess you started washing your face more, right? And so finding out little hacks like this that can really, really help. I want to be able to help share this knowledge and make impact on people's lives on a daily basis with that like kind of mundane stuff versus the anti-planner, I kind of call it a procrastination fire extinguisher. The point is not to use it every single day. The point is when you're like, oh, I have so much stuff I want to get done today. Or like, oh, like I've got this thing that I've been putting off and I want to take care of. Or like, oh my God, I have so much to do. That's when you reach for it. And so even if it's got that reduction of shame and guilt that planners kind of have of, oh, I stopped using this for months. Now it's, I've got all these blank pages and I feel like I don't want to touch this anymore because it's a giant reminder of my failure. Or Mm -hmm. I guess I'll just wait until January of next year. Having something that doesn't have calendars or dates that is meant to be used sporadically. So if it's been a year since you've used it, it's still as helpful as it was the day you bought it. And so that's really sort of my goal with, with the book was to create a toolbox, you know, kind of strategy guide that can help people when they need it. More of like a reactive type thing when you're just having those bad executive function. Hopefully it gives people that same kind of relief that I got when Jessica had mentioned on her YouTube channel, you know, the laundry thing. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So that's what's next for you. So what, so people can understand, and it seems pretty obvious, but what is your mission? I have not talked about this anywhere else either. So, uh, coaching with uh, exclusive number two. 
my company is called the Anti Boring Project, and so the Anti Planner right now is the first, the first sort of like productivity arm, you know, of this company. But the idea is that I want to take things that are good in theory and things that are helpful for other people, typically maybe neurotypicals or people who don't struggle with that thing, and I want to make a version for the invisible people who are struggling and don't have a tool to get them to that same outcome. And so being able to, especially taking mundane things that aren't difficult for other people and making Mm -hmm. them entertaining or fun, um, taking something that, you know, maybe in the future being able to do accessibility devices. So I've got a physical disability, also uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And so eventually this is years down the line. This is just an idea, but being able to make mobility devices that are really cool looking and like stylish because a lot of them look like medical devices. And in the same way that glasses, right? Glasses are a medical device, but like you can pick, you've got tons of options. You've got really cool looking ones. There are people who- Who don't even need them, right? I just think that there are underserved populations out there, people who deserve nice stuff. And I really want to make cool, creative stuff for, let me say those people, but also- First and foremost, stuff that I want. I'm going to do stuff that I want and then other people. People know that it's going to be an amazing product because (laughs) there's a need and you've tested it for yourself. So you can sell anything if you yourself believe in it and you're doing this for you, but also for the greater good. So I think that's awesome. I think that there's such a difference when, again, you've got that mentality of I'm building this for me and people like me versus, oh, I found this niche target audience that I'm not a part of, but I want to be able to exploit them to make money. Or I want to find, you know, I'm going to try to, you know, maybe even ask other people what their experience is like in order to gain information to just develop products, but it's still not coming from that authentic place of firsthand experience. And I think that I hear you. Yeah. Absolutely. Because there's a lot of like ADHD planners out there. And I look at it, I'm like, this is a regular planner, just with more stuff on with it. With the word ADHD on top of it. <laughs> Come on. You no, know, and then they're selling, they've got, you know, thousands of reviews on Etsy kind of thing. And if and look, it's not to say that some people with ADHD can't use planners. But the issue that I kept running into with planners was that I had to copy, like I use my Google Calendar. Google Calendar mm-hmm. is life. But like yeah. I would have to just rewrite down yes. meetings. And then if a meeting got rescheduled, like it messed up my whole thing. That would and so conflict with your, yeah. When, when it came down to it, it was so inconvenient that I, that I dropped it. The momentum can keep going if you decide that it's going to keep going. Yep. Captain, Captain Donnie <laughs> is going to take you back onto the tracks. That's so funny because there's so many like overlaps in what you're saying with my upcoming book, Activate Your ADHD Potential. Mm-hmm. I have a cover with like, lines that go all over the place until you get to where you need. And it's all about building and maintaining momentum. But with ADHD, we get burned out. You're right. We have that overwhelm, but then we get that new setting, a exciting idea after we get down to underwhelm and then it starts all over again. And it's just that cycle, right? So how do you take that cycle and just keep moving and building and maintaining momentum with it? And you have such these like practical tools that work for you and are colorful and work for the community. So I love that. I thank you. I think the big thing is that I specifically develop tools that are not, who are meant to not be used consistently. So that expect internal expectation of if I can't keep this going, I failed. That storyline disappears. And so if you are planning, like I will pick a productivity strategy and I'll be like, I'm just going to do this this week, or I'm just going to do like the Kanban boards. I'm just going to do this for this one. There's no attachment to it. There's no expectation. And honestly, if I sometimes look at it like a challenge, I'll do like a challenge where like, I'm going to get up at 530 every day this week. And I'm going to do three. I made a list of things habits that I want to do more often. I'm going to pick Mm -hmm. three of those things. I'm not going to tell myself what I'm going to do every morning. I'm going to let myself pick from this menu of options of things that I want to do more often. And I'm going to do three of those, but I tell myself I'm only going to do it for a week or sometimes I do two weeks. And then sometimes that two weeks will pass by 
and I will continue doing it, but like at a, even like not giving it my all, it's still so much more than I have been giving it. So I like really sprint so that I can just kind of like meander down to a walk versus trying to get up to a mm. walk and stay at a walk. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So it, it it's interesting. So you're saying sprint, but really like you are telling yourself that you're going to do this thing in the way that you want to. And if it only yeah. lasts a week, that's fine. Or if the finish line, you don't make it, that's okay because you're going to do another thing that's going to yeah. continue to build that momentum for you. Yeah. So it's just activating yourself. And being able to, to adjust what makes sense for you and like customize things. This is just sort of like a base to start from. And so I sort of look at trying new things in that way of when things don't work, it's not failure. It's just more information about what doesn't work. Love it. Love it. So there's definitely a theme that we've, you know, talked about here, you know, starting with what feels good to you and then, you know, putting it out there and not feeling like everything has to be an all or nothing thing. You can change things up, but what would be one thing that you would want to leave people with? here today if they're looking for help with their ADHD? One success tip for them. Okay. I'm going to give one that's really short, but getting an ADHD coach is life-changing. It was like, mm -hmm. it was so helpful. And the mindset that I have now, I was able to develop because of all the different things I tried from ADHD coaching, having someone who was there to remind me that it wasn't failure and that do we want to pivot or do we want to try something else? You know, having a guide will help it to to sink in and stick. So that's sort of part one, but that's not accessible to everybody because, you know, coaching takes money and there's things cost a lot more money than they used to. So and that's not a viable option for everybody. Um, but as far as a general one for kind of success, I really would say learning to write, like write down the things that have worked for you at some point so that when you forget, you've got that it's list. In front of the you. Same way that, like, I feel like I keep discovering the same things in therapy because I wasn't writing it down and I forget that I already had that epiphany. You know, um, it's crazy how fast things kind of fall out of my brain. And so having that sort of menu of things that you could try, trying to get, have that mentality that you don't have to stick with it forever. I love that. The body doubling thing. Okay. I'll do that too. The body doubling thing is amazing. So I knew there wasn't just one here. Yeah. Yeah. The body doubling thing is amazing for anyone who doesn't know what it is. It's where you just work alongside someone else, typically who might be you know, doing their own work and you're working quietly. And my favorite thing to do is virtually with friends, just set up like an online mm -hmm. meeting and we will share a screen that's got a Pomodoro timer on it. So we'll do 25 minutes of working, everybody on mute. And then we'll set, you know, that'll go off. We'll do five minutes of talking and we'll talk about what we got done and what we're going to do for the next timer. And then we put ourselves back on mute, start another 25 minute timer. And so we, mm -hmm. I call it avoidance murder party because we always do the things we've been dreading the most. And so if there's something during the week that comes up, that's like, oh my God, I don't want to deal with this. I go, I'm going to put that. I've got a little list and I go, I'll put this in my avoidance murder party list and I'll get to the, you know, I have got a planned day to take care of the most unpleasant things with people that I like so that I can complain about it the whole time. <laughs> I love your terminology for things. That's great. <laughs> and before we go, can you share one thing that you would tell Danny before she was 18 now that you know your ADHD? You're not as weird as you think you are. <laughs> You're really not. There's a lot of people who are just like you. You just haven't met them yet. Or own your weird, right? Yeah. Well, and I was, I mean, I was owning my weird, but it was one of those things where I really let it get to me more. And so now so much of my confidence has not just come from like, Ooh, I've gotten pretty successful at the things I've tried at. It is a lot of I have talked to so many people who are now able to be open about their struggles and, um, you know, are understanding and need someone to be seen that when someone tries to tell me that's not ADHD, you're just lazy. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. 
Like you, you can't. Don't know ADHD. And so when you're able to kind of deal with those feelings and truly accept, like, I am struggling because my brain is literally wired differently. And so holding myself to the same expectations is not only unfair, but it's going to set me up for cycles of disappointment and low self-esteem and self anger. And you only can start letting that go once you start to accept that, like, you have to find a way to do things your way, because Mm -hmm. a lot of times other people's ways are not going to be, you know, what helps you in the long term. I love that. So we'll definitely share. Yay. We'll definitely share your links in the show notes. And Danny, thank you so much for coming on Successful with ADHD. So good to see your face and hear your story. I know this is going to impact a lot of people who might be 18 year old Danny or 18 and a half or 32 year old Danny or even 50 year old Danny. So really appreciate you sharing your story to impact hundreds of thousands of people out there. Thank you so much for having me, Brooke. Thanks for listening to this episode of Successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, feel free to reach out to us at coachingwithbrook.com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.